this section we're going to continue looking what happens to our equilibrium reaction when we have changed it. Remember, in this section we're going to do temperature and we're going to look at catalysts, first of all. Then we're probably going to get into some graphs, depending on how we go with this. But remember, we've got the pressure, the, temp uh, the, the, the pressure and the concentration changes will affect it. Because when it's reached equilibrium, remember, I don't think I've got my, uh, no I haven't. But in equilibrium, it's in a balance, isn't it? So it's all nicely balanced. Now you come along and tinker with it. You change the balance. So it needs to rebalance itself. Okay? Now, temperature is something that is important in any reaction. Remember the Maxwell-Boltzmann curve that we did, proving that temperature actually affects a reaction. Now, let us look at what do we do when we have a temperature change. Okay? I want to give you, well, a recipe, but first of all, we're going to look at it from a theory point of view, temperature. All right. We said that temperature affects a rate, rate of reaction, doesn't it? As we could, why? Well, because I wanted, and I do love doing this, I wanted these things to hit, boing, and uh, sit together and form a product. That's what I wanted. So I've got to make sure they hit. So that you know what, the slower I make it, the less chance of these things hitting. Why? Because they basically fall asleep. I don't know about you, but when it gets really cold, I do. Okay, so do bears. But what we've got here is we've got the atoms and molecules do the same. They get tired. They want to go nap. Now, why is that? Because EK, let's just refresh our mind, EK is equal to a half mv squared. Ek was also a proxy for temperature. The average temperature, average kinetic energy is the temperature. What am I doing? I am removing energy. So if I remove, remove energy, I reduce its velocity. I'm relying on the velocity to hit these guys together. So that's not going to work. So if I re reduce the temperature, I am actually retarding the reaction. Okay? I am causing less and less effective collisions. So, obviously, we're going to look at the temperature. Now, step one. It's the same, remember, the other ones? Step one, the one with the gas, high and low pressure, concentration, identify which is changing. Step one over here is identify from the given information is delta H less than zero, delta H greater than zero. I'm going to do them both. Delta H, immediately we say that that is exothermic. This is endothermic. Okay, you write this down. The moment we've got that, you first off, you draw the graph without even thinking, and I say that is an exo, and this one over here is an endo. All right, draw the graph. And then you put in on this side is your reactant and product. This side, reactant, product. Put a little that line there, okay, then ah, they'll do. You know what? This is what you do. You don't go and take a thing. You make a sketch drawing to answer the question. So I say, right, that's an exothermic one. Just for simplicity's sake or just for the beauty of it, I just want to make that a little bit more pronounced like so. Eh, it'll do. Because we only need the concept. Then I label this thing and I say, okay, I just want to label you. You are forward. You are reverse. You are forward. You are reverse. Please, for the reaction you are given, when they talk about changing temperatures, you must do the drawing and label it. Okay? Then you can't go wrong. You're not leaving anything to chance. 
or to guessing. So now we've labeled that like that. Right. Now who's that guy? Le Chatelier again. This is the temperature change. What did we say? This stuff is in a closed pot, remember? Now all of a sudden you've turned up the heat on this pot. Okay. You have changed. You have changed one of the equilibrium conditions. Therefore, the reaction is going to seek to do the opposite. So therefore, if, and I'm only going to first of all talk about the exothermic, then we'll talk endo. So therefore, if I increase temperature, right? If I increase the temperature, I will favor the reverse reaction. Won't I? Why? Because what I still need to write on my graph, and this is what you put on, can you see the forward reaction, the one they've given us? This is exothermic. The reverse is endo, and I always write them like that, exo. So over here, the forward is endo, and the reverse is exo. I think you can see the, the, the logic coming now. Well, now everything is on my graph. All I have to do is look at it. I say if I increase the temperature, I favor the reverse. Why? Because endo needs heat. I tell some students, look, an endo reaction needs heat. The reverse reaction is endo. You need to go up. You're going to use more heat pushing it up that big slope, aren't you? Here we go. Okay, just for the fun of it. That's endo. You're going to use heat up this slope, aren't you? So you're going to be standing over here. You're going to be hotter than you were when you got there. Trust me. So that's just one way of looking at it for a bit of fun. But in essence, yes. You are an endothermic reaction requires heat to continue the reaction. All right? It needs heat to continue. So if I add heat, increased temperature is add heat. All right? I'm adding heat, therefore I favor the endo. Okay? How to do it? Add heat, favor which one? I look, whoops, let me just write it neatly over here. All right, I'm just going to go over here. I added heat. That favors endo. It is endo. Okay. Uh, which favors the forward. Sorry, the reverse reaction favors the reverse reaction because the reverse is endo. Favors reverse reaction. Okay, just logic it out. There I've written it. So if I add heat, I must favor the reverse reaction. Okay, so what is going to happen under those circumstances then? All right, therefore I am going to. Wait for it to do its thing. Okay. I am going to make more reactant. Therefore, increase the concentrations of those, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And I'm going to use up product to do so. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. Shall we? Um, Pull this up here. Now I'm going to reduce temperature. I'm going to reduce the temperature. If I reduce the temperature, please note I cool it down. Now I say okay. I go back to my chart and I say. Cooling is exo, right? 
removing heat is exo. Adding, endo, removing heat, exo. Cooling down, exo. So therefore, which am I going to fill? So I have removed heat. Therefore, it's an exo. Thermic, which then favors the forward reaction. Which means what? Which means that we make product and use up reactant. Which means the concentration of product will go up. The concentration of the reactants will go down in the ratio of the recipe, in the ratio of the mole ratios. Because you must always add one cup to two cups to get, or three cups to get two cups of ammonia. There's no other way, okay, that we're going to do it. Okay, and that is what's going to happen. Let us, for completeness sake, go through the other side, the endo. So if I told you that the initial reaction was endothermic, all right? So if I had an endothermic reaction, delta H is greater than naught. I've looked and that's what it's told me. So I say, right, I am going to now increase temperature. Aha, I go back. Increasing temperature is endo. Isn't it? If I increase the temperature, it's the same, remember, as add heat. Okay? It's endo. Increasing temperature is endo. Walking up, this, up that big hill is endo. Therefore, I favor the forward reaction. Boiling water requires heat. So if I, if I keep adding heat, I keep boiling the water, don't I? Until the water's all gone, I've boiled it off. I've burnt out the kettle and I'm in serious trouble for that. So if I increase the temperature, I favor the forward reaction, which means I make product and I use up reactants because that's what reactants are there for. Use up reactants. They're there for that, guys. They're there to be used up. Now the next one is I say, all right, I reduce temperature or cool it down. Okay, remove heat. I'm trying to give all the ones that are possible here. If I reduce, cool it down. Ah, reduce is exo. Cool, remove, reduce temperature is all exo. Exo, I go to my graph and I say, exo is the reverse one, right? Because it's cooling down. I'm freewheeling downhill. So I'm cooling down, right? Exo is favors the reverse reaction. Remember, please, you have to say according to Le Chatelier, blah, 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 blah. Okay, reverse reaction. Hence, we use up product to make reactants. Can you see what great ways these are for managing the, 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 equa the situation? If something is endo, all right, and you're making product, and you want to slow it down, you cool it down. Turn the heat down. Hello, anybody who's done any cooking knows that, because if it's getting boiling, you turn the heat down, and it stops the reaction. It stops the boiling. Okay. So all of this is ways that we're going to control the reactions. And I'm going to deal with something called yield in a, in, in, in a moment. The last one that we had here was the use of a catalyst. Now, what does a catalyst do, actually? All right. What does a catalyst do? Okay. All right. Okay. What does a catalyst do? Well, the catalyst does a very important thing. It actually just, remember, it reduces the amount of activation energy. Remember, just to quickly 
recap, we had that, okay, like that, let's say. But now if we added a catalyst, we got this comes in like that. The same thing occurs. This and this point don't change with a catalyst. All we do is we reduce Ea, okay? We reduce Ea. That is without, and the red is with a catalyst, okay? So with a catalyst, we reduce the activation energy. Obviously, that's a pretty good thing, isn't it? Why? Economics. Remember we went through this before? The economics. I mean, crikey, guys. If, we, if we're going to have to heat and push this thing and we find something that makes it cheaper, then we're going to do it that way, aren't we? Okay. Okay, cool. What did we say a catalyst does? Essentially, it gets us there quicker. That's all it does. So what the catalyst does, the catalyst increases the forward and reverse rates of reaction equally. It increases it equally. Okay? Now, therefore, what we can say is the catalyst actually has no effect. Okay? So if we add a catalyst, we don't affect the reaction. We don't favor. Okay? We put it in. We don't favor. The forward or the reverse reaction. Okay? We don't favor either. We, we favor both the same. That's all we're doing. Now, that's how we're going to do that. Before we now get to the next bit, I want to do an example quickly with you. Okay, I'm going to do uh, some more. Okay, but just look at this one. What about this? This is CO2 gas, okay, plus H2O liquid, and it's in equilibrium with H2CO3. H2CO3, okay, aqueous, and delta H less than naught. Now they say to us, well, first of all, let's see, what is this? Okay, Any, I guess many of you know. That's the carbonation, isn't it? Um, that's basically adding fizz to some form of, in this case, water. So we're creating soda water. Okay, we, we're putting gas into the water. Essentially, the gas dissolves in the water and it forms H2CO3. Okay, now... First of all, are we balanced? Okay, what do we do? Whoa, let's go right back. First of all, we balance metals, no metals, non metals, carbon, C, C, one on each side. Then we balance what? We balance the hydrogens. Okay, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, and last we bought oxygens, two, ah, there we go. Don't forget that guy there, there's three on each side. Therefore, we are balanced. Therefore, the mole ratio is one, one, one. I write it down here, 1 plus 1, and if I haven't really looked at things, I'm getting myself into trouble. Yes, that's the mole ratio. But remember, we've got gases, liquids, and aqueous solutions here. Delta H less than 0, which means it's exo. Okay. Now the question is, we're going to analyze this. We're going to say, first of all, okay, why does the gas escape when we open the bottle? Okay, question. Why does the gas escape when we open the bottle? Hmm. I'm just going to use green for the gas. I'm going to say, right, there's a gas. So on this side, I've got one mole of gas. And this side, I've got zero moles. This H2O is not a gas. Okay. It's also not affected by pressure. Uh, neither is H2CO3. All right? 
So only the gas, we only the gas. Remember we said that? Watch out for that. The liquids and the solids and the aqueous are not playing a role in this gas equation. Because we've asked the question, why does the gas escape when we open the bottle? Because logic says it should stay in the bottle. Right? Why does it come out? Remember when you squeeze the bottle? You can feel the pressure inside. Right? It's the same you can feel the pressure inside a tire. It's hard. It's only full of air. And there's air all around us. So what is that? There's a difference in pressure between the out inside and the outside, right? The pressure inside is higher than the pressure outside. Hang on. So this thing is, oh, let me just uh, go back to black. Let's just look at some physics here just for a second. Just so that we understand what the question is. Okay, we've got a bottle, my attempt at a bottle. This P inside and this is P outside. P inside is much bigger than P outside. All right? Because it wants to pop open. So there's a high pressure inside. Okay? And there's a pressure outside. Right. Now, when you open it, what are you doing? All right? When we open it, we open the bottle. We, let's just, let me just try and draw over here just so that we can see. Remember the liquids go up to there, okay? What is here? This is the pressure. This is gas pressure. That is actually CO2 in there, okay? There's a gas pressure inside there. So what happens, we open the, pre open the bottle, we reduce pressure. Everybody see that, I hope? Shh, we reduce the pressure. So this gas that's on top escapes. Now the reaction says, according to Le Chatelier, I was in equilibrium. I was happily sitting like a genie in my bottle. You have now taken the lid off. You've reduced the pressure. Therefore, Le Chatelier says, you must now do the reverse. You must try and increase the pressure. Increase the pressure. This is the high pressure side. That's where we've got pressure. Therefore, according to Le Chatelier, it seeks to increase pressure. How? It favors the reverse reaction. Can you see that? It favors the reverse. The reverse reaction creates pressure. Because as it was, okay, that reaction of these going to there, that's my high pressure side. There's my gas, this guy. So therefore, it favors the reverse reaction and... CO2 is created, right? Therefore, we see bubbles, okay? We see the bubbles as the CO2 is, cre is, is created. And if you leave the top off for a while, it's going to go flat, okay? Another part of this question, um, I, I'm just going to do it in a slightly different way. The question asks, okay, discuss what will occur if the temperature is increased or temperature is decreased. I'm going to say, have you ever noticed that when you buy a, let's just take a bottle of, of, of fizzy water, gas water, right? We take it off the shelf. It's not been cooled down. When you crack it open, you get a, pshh. do that with a tin, okay, of, of, of a cool drink as well. You will see it cracks open and you get quite a big fizz sometimes you actually get it spurting out without shaking it okay so what you've done is you've actually seen the gas coming out and it's there but now when you've got it and it's cold and you okay you don't get the same amount coming out why well what happens okay we're now talking about the words temperature 
So if you hear the word temperature, what do you do? Step one, <coughs> draw the curve. And the curve for this one is, I have said, it's an exothermic reaction. So I said I must draw an exo curve. Exothermic. Okay, and I label it. And I say this is my reactant. This is my product. This is forward. And it's exo. This is reverse. And it's endo. You can see it already, can't you? All right, I'm now going to get another page and bring it down slightly so that we've got them both there. All right, now let's say A, it's a warm drink. Warmth, okay, warm, favor, endo, therefore, Favor, reverse reaction. Favors the reverse reaction, okay? Which is create CO2 gas. And obviously, B, let's just look at it. If I cool it down, okay? If I cool it down, okay? Cool means remove heat. I cool it down, remove heat, favors exo, right, favors the exo, there's my exo up there, which means dissolve more gas, dissolve CO2 to create, let me just uh, tidy, the, whoops, sorry, to create, okay, uh, not too great. To create, to create H2CO3, aka in aqueous, which is product. Okay, there's one how you do it. Okay, so that's what you do when you look at the graph, when you look at the um, at the uh, uh, questions themselves. Where's the trick in this? The trick is simply to realize that there is gas only on one side. Be careful, okay? Where you have chemical reactions that are not all gas, okay? The bulk of them we do are, but there's always one or two floating around that don't have a gas in it, okay? So watch it when you talk pressure, you identify straight away moles of gas high and low pressure side. Okay, but remember, liquids, solids, not affected by pressure at all. Next one, I, I, I'm going to end this one. The next one we're going to look at is we're going to look at graphs of changes to equilibrium conditions. Okay, just so that we get a handle on how the graphs uh, are, are affected. You know, some, some syllabuses really put an emphasis on graphs. Some put more on the actual understanding of this. Some meld the two together quite well. Okay. That's it. Thank you for watching. And we're going to do graphs next. I'm looking forward to it. Hope you are. Cheers. Bye.